Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Lovely to see you on this bright uh, summer's day. Welcome to those just arriving. Good to see you as well. Good morning, all. Uh, it's a good day, isn't it? It's a good day. Uh, particularly warm welcome to anyone uh, new or visiting. We've got various new people around who've been, uh, for whom either this is the first time here or they've been around a few weeks or just a month or so. Great to see the church family uh, expanding uh, like that. Uh, my name's Matt, I'm the vicar. I'll be leading the service, I'll be speaking uh, later. But I do need to say, uh, first of all, uh, thank you to those of you who were involved in yesterday's uh, spring clean and gardening. I think, oh, I, I just need to check. Um, you did a very good job. <laughs> well, well done, everybody. Uh, appreciate your, all the time you gave up uh, for that. Uh, let me introduce to you uh, the theme of this service. If we could have that up on the screen, please, Paul. Are you willing to do hard things for Jesus? That's what we're thinking about today. Are you willing to do hard things? Are you prepared to put Jesus first? Are you, are you prepared to suffer for him and to do whatever he tells you to do? So it's a really exciting theme. We're going to see how the Apostle Paul put Jesus first. Uh, but it's also really challenging. Hopefully we'll leave here thinking, yeah, I want to, I'm prepared to live a challenging life for Jesus. So that's where we're going uh, this morning. But we're going to start with the words of greeting, if we can have those up. Uh, throughout the service, I say the words in yellow, and then we say together any words in white. So grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. And we pray together. Loving God, we have come to worship you. Help us to pray to you in faith to sing your praise with gratitude and to listen to your word with eagerness. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And we have uh, this call to worship. Uh, we start by saying this together. But there are words that I say too. Together. You created all things, O God, and are worthy of our praise forever. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you have created all things, and by your will they have their being. You are worthy, O Lamb, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed for God saints from every tribe and language and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests serving our God, and they will reign with you on earth. To the one who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honour and glory and might for ever and ever. Amen. You created all things, O God, and are worthy of our praise forever. He is worthy of our praise forever. So let's stand and give it to him. Let's stand and praise God. We've got a couple of songs, and the first has some wonderful words. Christ triumphant, ever reigning, Saviour, Master, King, Lord of heaven, our lives sustaining. Hear us. As we sing, I stand.
what a lovely way to start the service. Do take your seats and then we'll pray for our youngest members before they go out to their Sunday club. Uh, let's pray. Uh, Father, we've just sung a wonderful truth that you love the world so much you gave your one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We thank you for the faith you've given us that you've brought us to eternal life in Christ and we pray for all these young people heading off to Sunday Club now, that you would give them the same gift, that you'd give them that precious gift of faith in Jesus Christ, <coughs> that believing in him, they too will have eternal life. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, you know what to do, young ones. Head to the back. You're going next door. I think you're doing, is it Athanasian Creed today? That's right. So if you want to know about that particular creed, uh, I won't say it again because I struggle to say that word. <laughs> uh, they're going to be learning about the Trinity, one God, three persons. So look at their work cut out today. Their brain, when they come back, their brains might be a bit frazzled. Uh, but as for the rest of us, we're going to be preparing our hearts and minds now for a time of uh, confession. And of course, we confess our sins, knowing we're unworthy, but Christ died for us. And so that when we confess our sins, he freely forgives us, so long as we're believing in Jesus Christ. The word of God is living and active. It judges the thoughts and intentions of the heart. All is open and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we give account. So let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, saying together, most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. My friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin. And so may Almighty God, who sent his Son into the world to save sinners, bring us his pardon and peace, now and forever. Amen. And we say the prayer of uh, prayer for today together. Faithful Creator, whose mercy never fails, deepen our faithfulness to you and to your living word, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing again, giving glory to God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Let's stand and sing glory.
please take your seats. I don't remember that track having drums in. That was fantastic. Uh, we're going to have a Bible reading. And who's been bringing us a Bible reading? Neville. Neville's going to bring us a Bible reading. As he makes his way up, we might like to turn to Acts chapter 21. Today's reading is, uh, can be found on Acts 21, verses 1 to 16. And is entitled, On to Jerusalem. After we torn ourselves away from them, we put out to sea and sailed straight to Cos. The next day, we went to Rose and from there to Patara. We found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia went on board and set sail. After sighting Cyprus, passing to the south of it, we sailed on to Syria. We landed at Tyre, where our ship was to unload its cargo. We sought out the disciples there and stayed with them seven days. Through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. When it was time to leave, we left and continued on our way. All of them, including wives and children, accompanied us to the city. There on the beach, we knelt to pray. After saying goodbye to each other, we went aboard the ship and they returned home. We continued our voyage to Tyre and landed at Ptolemus, where we greeted the believers and stayed with them for a day. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea, and stayed at the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. After we had been a a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, The Holy Spirit says, In this way the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there pleaded Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. After this, we started on our way to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples from Caesarea accompanied us and brought us to the home of Mason, where we were to stay. He was a man from Cyprus and one of the early disciples. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you very much, Neville. Uh, let's just bow our heads and pray uh, for a moment. Holy Spirit, would you help us? Help us to understand your word to us today. Not just understand it, but apply it to our lives. We're going to think about a challenging topic. Please challenge each one of us and help us to grow as a result. In Jesus' name. Amen. Are you willing to do hard things for Jesus? Are you willing to pay a price? Are you willing to suffer for the Lord? Are you willing to do things for God, even though they may make your life harder than it already is? That's what we're thinking about today. But we begin with a quick recap. You may remember that we're working our way through the book of Acts, and the book of Acts tells us the true story of how uh, the church and the apostles were empowered by the Holy Spirit to take the good news out into the world. The good news that Jesus is the Lord and Saviour we need. Uh, And and in more recent weeks, we've been thinking about uh, the Apostle Paul and the really important role uh, he played in that. And in today's reading, Paul is approaching the end of his third missionary journey. 
It was a long journey, about 3,307 miles in length. Such was his commitment to spreading uh, the good news about Jesus. And so we get to chapter 21. That's where we pick things up today. Uh, Paul's only recently, if you remember, finished uh, saying goodbye to the, the elders of the church in Ephesus. So we had a tearful goodbye with them, and we find out what happens next. He's now heading back to Jerusalem with his team of helpers. And so uh, in our Bibles, in the first verse, we see that they start off in Miletus. So that's that purple oval at the top. That's where they start off. And then they take a ship and they go down to Tyre uh, in uh, Syria. And then something amazing happens. Well, not sorry, not amazing. It's a, yeah, over the top. Something interesting happens. Uh, through the Spirit... They urged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. So they get to Tyre. They spend seven days with the disciples in Tyre. And then they urge Paul, that's it, don't go any further. Don't go to Jerusalem. And as we read on, it becomes clear why that is. It's because uh, the Holy Spirit has revealed to these Christians in Tyre that it's going to be very dangerous if he goes to Jerusalem. So the Holy Spirit says, look, it's going to be dangerous for Paul to go. And how do they react? Well, they urge him not to go. Don't go, Paul. It's too dangerous. Just don't go. If you go to Jerusalem, you're going to get into big trouble. Stay away. Uh, Maybe it's a bit like if uh, you're at the beach and uh, you see a friend about to go for a swim in the sea, and you see a sign like that, you'd scream at the top of your voice, wouldn't you? Stop it! Don't go in! It's too dangerous! Well, that's what these Christians in Tyre are doing. Paul, you mustn't go in! Don't go to Jerusalem. It's too dangerous. And so what does Paul do? Does he uh, heed the warning? Does he run in the opposite direction? No, he completely ignores it. Uh, So verse 5 says, When it was time to leave, we left and continued on our way. You could easily sort of just skim past that sentence. But he's just been warned. But no, no, we're going to continue. We're going to go to Jerusalem, even though we know how dangerous it is. They went because they knew God wanted them to go. And Paul had known for some time that God wanted him to go to uh, Jerusalem. So back in uh, Acts 19, 21, uh, Luke, who's writing this book, says, After all this happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem passing through Macedonia and Archaea. After I've been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. And then we get uh, to Acts 20, so that we thought about this last week. Paul says, now compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me and the task of testifying uh, to the good news of God's grace. So you see, the Apostle Paul knew two things because the Holy Spirit had revealed it to him. He knew he had to go to Jerusalem. He had to. But he also knew that when he got to Jerusalem, he would suffer a great deal. But he went anyway. Why did God want Paul to go to Jerusalem when it was going to be so dangerous for him to go there? Well, there are two main reasons. One was to provide financial help uh, to the poor believers in Jerusalem. And the second reason uh, was to testify about Jesus and tell people the good news of God's grace. That's why he had to go. He had to go. It would be tough, but it would be worth it. People would get to hear about Jesus, people would get saved, and the poor Christians there would be helped. So interestingly, in Paul's trip to Jerusalem, we have quite a good summary, I think, of the church's mission. Uh, We're to care for those in need, uh, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ, because they're our family. And we are to testify to the good news of God's grace. So we're to tell as many people as we can, as far and wide as we can, about the free gift of uh, salvation, forgiveness, reconciliation to God that we can have because of Jesus. These things are important. They're so important, nothing was going to stop Paul from going to Jerusalem and doing it. And so it raises a couple of questions I think I'd like us to think about. 
Uh, for example, are, are we prepared to make big sacrifices to help Christians in need? And are we prepared to do whatever it takes to help spread the gospel, no matter what the cost? Because Paul was prepared to do that. So was his team. And so they continued on their way <coughs> to Jerusalem. And as I was uh, thinking about this, I was I reminded of a, a talk that some of us heard during the week over at St. John's uh, by Archbishop Justin Badi Arama. He's the, the Archbishop of South Sudan. And it was a, a real privilege to hear him speak. And one of the things he did was express his gratitude. Uh, I went to East Africa myself some years ago, and it's really noticeable how the Christians there are so thankful for the way missionaries left this country years ago to take them the gospel. Uh, and so a number of times over the morning, he said, I want to thank you for your grandparents, like referring to our ancestors. He'd say, we're so thankful in South Sudan that your grandparents gave up everything to come to Africa and tell us about Jesus. Uh, and he talked about how they made great sacrifices, how pretty much all of the early missionaries went to South Sudan knowing they'd die there. They'd either get some awful disease that there was no medication or vaccination for in those days, or they'd be killed when they got there. The missionaries went knowing that's, that was their future in East Africa, but it was the only way those East Africans were going to hear about Jesus and get saved, so they went anyway. And the people of East Africa were so thankful. And so he urged us to, to follow the example of our spiritual grandparents. The number of times he urged us to stay in the truth and uh, be willing to make sacrifices for Jesus like they did. Well, over the years, many missionaries have travelled to dangerous parts of the world to spread the gospel, and Paul was one of the first. But before we continue, I need to deal with what might seem like a contradiction. I wonder if you noticed it. Uh, because in Acts 20, verse 22, uh, it says, Paul was compelled by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. But then we get to our reading this morning, and it says, uh, Acts 21, verse 4, through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go. Do you see the potential contradiction there? On the one hand, God's Spirit saying, Paul, I want you to go. And then you appear to have these Christians in Tyre saying, don't go. And the Spirit's involved in that too. Well, I don't think it's a contradiction. What I think is happening is that the Holy Spirit revealed to those Christians in Tyre how dangerous it was going to be, and then they wrongly concluded that Paul shouldn't go. God told them it would be dangerous. He didn't tell them Paul shouldn't go. That was their wrong, mistaken conclusion. But can you imagine... Um, Try and put yourself in Paul's shoes. This put Paul in a really tough situation. He was facing serious danger, and he had people urging him not to go. It was a double blow, and I just wonder, what would you do in that situation? And what would you do if you knew what God wanted you to do, but you knew it would be costly, and you had people you care about telling you not to do it? Are you still going to do what God wants in that situation? Uh, so I think these two questions clarify it. Will you obey God even if you know it's going to be costly for you to do that? And will you obey God when other people are telling you not to do the thing he wants? Well, these are tough questions, aren't they? Maybe it would help us to think about some real-life examples. And I wanted to go for real, really hard ones, even controversial ones. So I'll give you a couple of scenarios. Think about what you're doing things. I want you to imagine... <laughs> no, that doesn't work. I want you to imagine you're a committed Christian. Hopefully you don't have to imagine that part of the story. <laughs> you're a committed Christian. Uh, and you love Jesus, but imagine this. Imagine you're attracted to people of the same sex. You're considering getting into a relationship. Now, you know what the Bible says about sex being from, between a man and a woman in marriage. But you, you want to do it. You've, you've got people telling you to do it. You've got people telling you you've got to be true to yourself. It's wrong not to act on those feelings. And you know that if you don't act on those feelings, 
Well, that's going, to be a, that's going to be hard for you, isn't it? That's going to be so hard. Maybe you're seeing other people hooking up, dating, getting married, and, and you're thinking, well, is that going to be a possibility for me? That's really hard. What are you going to do? You're going to do what God wants, what he says in the Bible, or are you going to do what you're drawn to, what other people are telling you to do? Or imagine this situation. This is a situation I've experienced myself, uh, so I know how hard it is. Uh, imagine a member of your family transitions to the opposite sex. Uh, either it's a man who identifies as a woman, or a woman as a man, or, or something else. Now you know what the Bible says about this, that God makes us male and female. It's right there at the very beginning. God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And Jesus quotes this text to the New Testament, so it still applies in New Testament times, that there are two genders and God decides which we are. So if God decides which we are, and it's part of our creation, part of our humanity, then we can't transition from one to the other. So you've got that, you've got the biological reality and what the Bible says, but what if this person you love so much tells you, look, if you don't accept my decision and celebrate it with me, then I, I won't ever see you again. Like people are put in that situation. What do you do? You're a Christian, you know what the Bible says, but if you hold to that teaching of the Bible, it's going to be really hard. What do you do? Well, certainly you want to be loving, don't you? You must be kind. You must be kind to them. Uh, you mustn't be transphobic. But at the same time, you've got to be prepared to do what God wants you to do. And how that's going to work out in your particular situation... Well, you're going to need great wisdom about that, aren't you? There's no, like, oh, here's my 20-second answer on how to deal with this incredibly difficult pastoral situation, so I'm not even going to attempt it. I just want you to think about, are you prepared to do what God wants in that situation, whatever that might be? Are you prepared to put God and the truth first in your life? Okay, here's a less controversial, difficult scenario. Um, what do you do if your employer wants you to tell a lie, or cut a corner, or fiddle the books, or cheat somebody, or, or do something else unethical in the workplace? Okay? Easier, but still difficult in practice. Will you do what God wants you to do, even though there could be serious consequences? Or, or do you just do what your employer says? Half of everybody else is doing it. Why not? So, so I think life is full of uh, situations in which we have to choose between doing what God wants to do and doing the easier thing that other people want you to do. I'll, I'll show you this Bible story over dinner with my children. Uh, one of them says, oh yeah, that was a bit like what happened today. All the other kids were making fun of this child and I refused to join in because I knew God says that's wrong. And yet other people were looking at my daughter in this instance Thinking, oh, why are you joining in? So there was a cost, there was a price to pay for doing the right thing. So the big question then is, do we love God enough to put him and his will first in our lives, before ourselves, before what other people tell us to do? The Apostle Paul was totally committed to doing that. And so he continues on his journey to Jerusalem. Uh, but first, we read this. This is a very moving scene. Try, try to picture it if, if you can. Uh, this is still in Tyre. Uh, all of them, including wives and children, accompanied us out of the city. And there on the beach, we knelt to pray. After saying goodbye to each other, we went aboard the ship and returned home. And so the first thing I want to say is just notice how much they love one another. You've got the whole church there. They're gathered on the beach. Paul and his team are about to get on the ship. And they all gather to say goodbye there on that beach. Everyone's there, uh, young and old, uh, husbands and wives, children too. It's a very emotional uh, moment because they love one another as family. It's very reminiscent, actually, of last week. 
So uh, previously there was this tearful goodbye, wasn't there, as Paul was saying goodbye to those leaders in Ephesus. And here on that beach, they pray for one another. They kneel in the sand, the whole church family, uh, to pray. Now we don't know what they prayed, but there is a reminder here, isn't there, first, about the love we're to have for one another as family, that we pray for one another, that we pray for one another's physical and spiritual needs. Uh, so, so maybe this is an opportunity for me uh, to remind you of the prayer meetings we have. We have a 6.15 prayer meeting on Zoom every Monday. We have prayer meetings in here at 9.30 on Saturdays. It's really good to pray for one another. Uh, they did. So what happens next? We continued our voyage from Tyre and landed at Ptolemy, uh, where we greeted the brothers and sisters and stayed with them for a day. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven. Okay, let's get the map, map uh, back up. Let's see where they are. Uh, so they're down in the bottom right-hand corner now uh, in Caesarea, sort of a, a coastal city. Uh, next stop is Jerusalem. Do you see Jerusalem just below? That's where they're headed. Uh, but we're told that Paul stayed in Caesarea uh, for, for a while. How long were they there? Uh, leaving the, one day. Stayed in Caesarea for one day at the home of Philip the Evangelist, who had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. Okay, prophecy. What do you think about prophecy? There are Christians have different views on this, don't they? Um, my own personal understanding is that the gift of prophecy was much more common then than it is now. In fact, that it's largely seized today, because unlike them, we have the completed Bible, the completed Word of God. They needed God to teach them more directly through prophets in those early days before the scriptures uh, were complete. And uh, one of the reasons I think that, and it'd be worth thinking about this verse, is Ephesians 2, 19 uh, to 20, where it says that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And so I believe that in those early days, you had the apostles, you had uh, people with a special spiritual gift of prophecy and they were laying the foundation. And all these new churches were popping up all over the place and then the apostles would move on. They needed people who would teach them. And that was the role of those uh, spirit-inspired prophets. I don't, think this, I don't think this doesn't mean that God can still speak to people directly today. I think that can happen and probably does happen. But it's just not as common as it was then nor should we expect, necessarily, to experience it ourselves. Okay. Um, so, we're told that Philip's daughters prophesied, but we're not told what they, pro they prophesied. Um, but we are told about this man called Agabus. Let's think about Agabus. Uh, after we'd been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said... The Holy Spirit says, in this way, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. So yet again, we have another warning. Paul, it's going to be really dangerous when you go to Jerusalem. Uh, this time it's coming from this prophet Agabus. And he even acts out what's going to happen to Paul when he gets there. He's going to be handed over to the Gentiles, or by which he means the, the Roman authorities. And, uh, interestingly, Agabus doesn't tell him to go. He just says what's going to happen when he gets there. So how do the Christians in Caesarea respond to this frightening warning? When we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. What's really interesting here is it says, when we heard this, we and the people there. So we includes Luke, who's writing this book, uh, and the team of missionary partners with Paul. Before it was just uh, the people of Tyre. Now, uh, now the whole missionary team are getting a bit twitchy and a bit nervous. Like, oh, are we really going to do this? And so they urge, they plead with Paul, no, don't go. Can you imagine the pressure on Paul right now? Even his closest friends are saying, you, you can't do it, Paul. Don't go to Jerusalem. You're going to get arrested, maybe killed. How does Paul respond? It's very moving. 
Then Paul answered, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? In other words, why are you doing this? This is already really hard. This is so difficult. I'm going to have to go to Jerusalem. God's telling me to go. It's going to be really hard. I don't know what's going to happen to me. It's going to be scary. And friends, you're just making it so much harder for me. I've got to go. Uh, You see, his friends have really good intentions. They're just trying to do what's best, aren't they? They want to keep him safe. But actually, their words made it harder for him to do what God wanted. And he continues, uh, I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. That's a really key verse. You know, he's determined to go to Jerusalem. He's willing to be bound and die if necessary. There is no price he's not willing to pay to do the thing God wants him to do. And so eventually they, the friends are persuaded. They give up trying to change him, to, uh, ask, give up trying to get him to change his mind. Uh, when he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. So I think there are two, at least two important lessons for us here. That we need to be humble and accept God's will for our lives. That's the first. Let's get that up on the screen. We need to be humble and accept God's will for our lives. We need to be prepared to say the Lord's will be done, even if what God's will for our lives is really hard and we might prefer it not to happen. So it might be suffering. Maybe you've been suffering for a prolonged period of time and you're starting to get the feeling that no matter how much you pray about it, maybe the pain's going to continue. Well, that might be a sign that it's God's will for your life. Are you going to be humble and accept God's will, as hard as that is for you? We need to be humble and accept God's will. And then secondly, and I quite like this one, sometimes we need to be stubborn for Jesus' sake. Do you see how stubborn Paul is throughout this story? He's got loads of people telling him, no, Paul, don't do it. Don't do it, Paul. It's a big mistake. You go to Jerusalem, you're going to get hurt. Stop it, Paul. Don't do it. And he just keeps going. He's stubborn, but in a really godly way for Jesus. Uh, Sometimes we have to be stubborn. We have to say to ourselves and we have to say to other people that I'm going to do what God wants. uh, Nothing, no one and no situation is going to stop me. It's a challenging passage, isn't it? I guess most of us would like the Christian life to be easy. But sometimes we're called to do very hard things for Jesus. And so off he goes, uh, boldly, courageously, stubbornly, faithfully doing what God wants. But listen to this. Uh, After this, we started on our way up to Jerusalem. (laughs) Some of the disciples from Caesarea accompanied us. Hang on. Weren't they the ones begging him not to go because it was so dangerous? What's going on? Well, they're they're now going to Jerusalem too. It would appear Paul's courage has rubbed off on them. That his example has inspired them. And they're thinking, well, if Paul's going to go, we're going to go too. Despite their fears and foreboding, they went to the place of suffering with Paul. They knew Paul would be a marked man in Jerusalem. They knew he faced hatred and imprisonment, maybe even death. They knew that going with him would put their lives at risk, but they went anyway. His courage and example inspired them to do hard things for Jesus. And so I want to finish by saying this. Like them, uh, we live at a time when the kingdom of God needs Christians to stand up and be counted. To be willing to suffer. And if necessary, as it is in some parts of the world, to even die for Jesus and the truth of the gospel. God's will is for us to be strong and courageous Christians who go out into the world speaking the truth about Jesus and faithfully living the Christian life. There will be suffering. There is a price to pay for faithfulness to God and the truth. And so that big question remains... Are you willing to do hard things for Jesus? Let's pray.
Holy Spirit, fill us. Give us strength. Give us courage. Give us the power we need to go into the world, to live the way you want us to live, to do the things you want us to do, and to testify to the good news of your grace in Christ Jesus. Lord God, you have called us to something big. You have given us important work to do and a message to spread. We cannot do it without your help. So please equip and empower us for the work you have given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to uh, continue in prayer. And Anne Harmsworth is going to bring us our prayers. God of all creation, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We give you thanks and praise for the wonders and blessings you have given to us. Let us pray. God of all creation, help us to praise and worship you when we realise the wonders of your world through our senses of being able to see or hear or touch. We praise and thank you for the variety of creation of creatures on land, in the sea, or in the air. We thank you for all your people in their different cultures and environments. And may we remember the responsibilities you have given us as stewards of your creation. Please forgive us for neglecting these responsibilities through carelessness, greed, and ignorance the consequences of our behaviour. We pray for your guidance to help us all make the small changes that we are able to do in our own lives so we can come to meet our responsibility and care as you intended. Guide us to embrace the changes that provide a sustainable society where all people are able to share the world's riches according to their need. Lord, in your mercy, hear Amen. Loving and compassionate God, we pray for all people living in various countries who have been affected by war, extreme weather conditions, whose homes and lives of loved ones have been destroyed. We pray for those who are trying to grow and produce food for their families under already difficult circumstances, who have seen their crops ruined and don't know where food for themselves and family will come from. Please help these distressed people to realise they are not alone. Because you see their needs, and in your love you will guide your followers and others to provide the support needed. We pray for those in our own community who are anxious about paying their bills and buying food for their families. And we thank you that we can contribute to the food bank to help them. We pray you'll come to know you, the bread of life, and the salvation that comes to everyone who repents, believes, and follows you. Lord, in your mercy, hear. Almighty God, we pray for the worldwide church, our brothers and sisters who proclaim your presence and power in their lives. We ask that all believers proclaim with joy your gospel of truth, sharing and acting upon your word, and be filled with grace to live lives to your glory. We pray for those who are victimised because of their belief in you. We pray they will be given the strength and courage to do your will, even though they are aware they could suffer or even die doing so. May the example of Paul's readiness to suffer and die for the name of the Lord Jesus give them the courage to teach the truth of your word and do your will, 
however dangerous. We especially pray for Christians in South Sudan, their Archbishop and other church leaders in the challenging circumstances in which they live, as well as the church in Bangladesh. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray for our community on Camford Heath. Help everyone to be loving in their homes and family. Please keep us from being impatient, grumpy or bad-tempered with those who do not agree with us. Help us to be cheerful when our plans are upset or have to be changed. May we learn to be tolerant, to love and understand one another better and consider others before ourselves. We pray for the lonely and anxious who find it hard to make friends. We pray that they know what a friend they have in Jesus and can take all their cares to him in prayer. May all people come to know your love for them through us. Lord, in your mercy, hear Amen. our prayer. Loving Father, we pray for those who are ill, in constant pain, those ill in body or mind. We pray they will all know your comforting presence and healing power in their lives and gain peace from that. In a quiet moment, we will name those known to us in our hearts. We bring to you anyone we know who is feeling sad at the death of a loved one. We pray they be comforted by the assurance that those who believe in you have eternal life. We also remember those whose anniversaries are at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, we know that following your plan for us is not easy at times. Please help us to trust you and do this right according to your will. As we go out from this place of worship today, help us to remember we are more than slaves to earthly temptations, but as spiritual beings sustained by your words in the gospel. We pray your children in partnership in the gospel will share, read and act upon your word. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Anne, would you please be upstanding, if you're able, uh, for the peace? Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us offer one another a sign of peace. some hand sanitizer coming around once uh, you've got that if you want that uh, you're, free, you're free to sit down and as, as I usually say if you know and love the Lord Jesus and you've been confirmed or baptized as a believer then you're very welcome to share in Holy Communion with us today uh, but if you've not yet made that personal commitment to trust and follow Jesus, then I would ask you to remain seated, and when the time comes, I'll say a prayer for you. at this point of the service, I wonder what are those watching online thinking is happening right now? Why is the vicar just standing there silently doing nothing? 
Well, it's because people are getting their hands sanitized, that's why. Okay, let's begin. The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right, it is our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give you thanks and praise, Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. For he is your living word. Through him you have created all things from the beginning and formed us in your own image. Through him you have freed us from the slavery of sin, giving him to be born of a woman and to die upon the cross. You raised him from the dead and exalted him to your right hand on high. Through him you have sent upon us your holy and life-giving spirit and made us a people for your own possession. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Accept our praises, Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And as we follow his example and obey his command, grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit these gifts of bread and wine may be to us his body and his blood, who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, Heavenly Father, we remember his offering of himself, made once for all upon the cross. We proclaim his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. We look for the coming of your kingdom. And with this bread and this cup, we make the memorial of Christ, your Son, our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in your glory. Accept through him, our great high priest, this our sacrifice of thanks and praise. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of your divine majesty, renew us by your spirit, inspire us with your love, and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Glo blessing and honour and glory and power be yours forever and ever. Amen. Now, as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ which he gave for you and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith 
with thanksgiving. Uh, a blessing for those not receiving communion. I'll give that in just a minute. I want to welcome the children back. Uh, something come on back. So come on in, take your seats, uh, because this blessing is for you too, and I don't want you to miss it. You can tell us all about the Athanasian Creed later on over coffee or juice. Thank you, leaders, uh, for looking after and teaching the children uh, this morning. I was just about to say this blessing for those of us not receiving uh, the bread and wine today. So children and anybody else not receiving, uh, this is for you. And may the almighty and merciful Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you and keep you. Amen. <coughs> may the body and blood of Christ keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen.
loving Father, we thank you for feeding us at the supper of your Son. Sustain us with your Spirit, that we may serve you here on earth, until our joy is complete in heaven, and we share in the eternal banquet with Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, before we sing our final song, remember what the Apostle Paul said. I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. He was willing to do anything for the Lord Jesus. Are we? Are you prepared to do anything for Jesus, no matter what the cost? Can you say, I will offer up my life? If you can, let's stand and do that now. church family news and the first I should have mentioned earlier is that prayer ministry is available at the moment so maybe there's something going on in your life that you'd like uh, prayer for or maybe there's something in the sermon or in the bible reading that really struck you and you want to pray about that uh, prayer ministry is on in the chapel and I would encourage you to go uh, to the chapel at the back there and if someone's there already uh, just wait outside and you'll be invited in and then otherwise, it's just the normal uh, announcements. Thank you uh, for those of you who give uh, financially to sustain and grow this church. Uh, there is a card we do at the back. There's a basket where you can put cash. There is a financial giving blue form on the table just to the right of the door there. Uh, we're grateful for anything you give. And then we would just encourage you to stick around for refreshments after the service. Maybe uh, talk to somebody you don't know or somebody you haven't seen uh, for a while. Let's finish uh, with a final prayer and blessing. Heavenly Father, you have drawn us who believe into your family through the death and resurrection of your Son. And now we ask that you fill us with your Holy Spirit, 
so that we live faithfully and serve sacrificially so that whatever we do, we do it all for the glory of your holy name. Amen. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Amen. The Lord says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.